was out in the wilds waiting to catch the last train that went right across Canada. But by the look of the station, the line had already closed down a long time ago. I'd just about given up hope when... So far, I'd covered the eastern half of this enormous country. Now I was heading west through the Rockies to Vancouver and the Pacific, after a detour north to the legendary Hudson Bay. It was 4,000 miles of rugged, pioneering territory, inhabited, I imagine, mostly by beavers, mounties and moose. And this wasn't the Orient Express. Out here, they didn't seem to bother with sissy stuff like platforms and steps. And so I was off into the Canadian wilderness on the train that had opened up the country and was about to close down. I felt more like an explorer than a journalist in this harshly beautiful land. Because no one lives out here, and the train's not exactly crowded either. Or no bigger than bigger than DC-3, no, about 45 passengers or so, something like that. Good, good I'll have to fly my Learjet in there then. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I'll have to get It's $14. <laughs> Canada was first explored by French Canadian fur trappers, moving north and west in search of beaver, one of Canada's national symbols. There's still way more beaver than people out here, which makes it tough to run a railroad. Beaver dams can wash away the track and even wreck a train. I learned this from George Karasek, who's been hired by the railway to protect it from the beavers. Uh, who do you work for, George? I work for Argoma Central Railway. I see. I'm what, blowing up these dams? Well, it's a uh, nuisance beaver control. That's, uh, that's my official title is Beaver Patrolman. B beaver Patrolman? That's right. <laughs> What's wrong with the beaver dams? They damage the railway or what? Yes, ask engineer for some pictures of the yeah. washouts. When you see engines laying on the side yeah. and 20 cars piled on the top of it. And all caused by a few beavers. That's right, maybe just one only. George was just starting his day's work. He invited me to get off at the next station and give him a hand. Out here, many people still use canoes. But George and I were traveling by railroad. This section of track has been washed away repeatedly and George and I were off to find the guilty beaver. Holy cow, Dicky! George took me to a dam he'd already demolished several times. Each time the beavers had rebuilt it. Okay. Now it was Most a choice, there. the train or the beaver. beaver. In this case, we just cannot talk the beaver out of it uh, to move someplace else, so we have to remove them by uh, traps. If you want me to, I show you how it works. Uh, for instance, this is a beaver's head. Beaver comes swimming downhill with a handful of mud. George showed me how to trap a beaver, but I got the feeling he'd rather have one as a friend. What's your opinion then of the personality of the beaver, George? I think, I think it's rather admirable because the beaver is a uh, very industrious animal. Like you see, they can make something out of nothing. Uh -huh. You see, there was nothing here before and they made a dam and they made their own home. So that's like, it's almost like some of the Canadians, uh, like including myself. You move someplace where there's nothing and you make your own home.
never actually sighted a beaver. But I hope to do better with another Canadian symbol, the moose. My guide was moose calling champion, Gerald Dupre. What you can do is uh, pretend you're walking. It's another moose walking in the yeah. water. And then what happens, the female usually pees. I mean, nope. is it like an opera singer or nope. anybody you think can do it? They were laughing. It's all right. My technique well. must have needed a little polish. It doesn't hear it again how it ends. I knew there were a lot of moose out there, and my trip was far from over. Somewhere in Canada, there had to be the moose for me. Back in civilization in the town of Cochrane, Ontario. This train is called the Polar Bear Express. It turned out to be a freight train with one passenger car. It was loaded with groceries, machinery, booze, all the basic necessities of life for the small towns north of Cochrane. It carries everything except cars, because no road runs north of here. Only the iron road I was riding. The Polar Bear Express isn't the world's fastest train, but it's had a song written about it. is Lawrence Martin, a Cree Indian who loves to ride the train himself. There are no settlements out here, just the odd cabin or camp of hunters. They are dropped off one week and picked up the next, often with a fresh moose for the baggage car. This is home for John Levesque, who lives here 50 miles from his nearest neighbor, along with 12 dogs and 20 cats. Like many along this route, he seemed to be searching for solitude. Get up, puppy. How's it going, puppy? Come on, my girl. We'd only stop for a moment, but I was curious about his life out here. You know the names of all these cats? No, but my dog have a name, but not my cat, because I have too many of them. Yeah, yeah. Hello, my man, you're What's it like to live out here? Like, what's the winter like? It's more to it's cold, uh -huh. very cold. 
on 38, 45 below, and lots of wind. But that, that's the kind of life I like, yeah. quite, but I love it. Uh -huh. But I like, I'm, I'm in the bush, man, I like the, I like the bush. Bye, John. Nah. <laughs> okay, to go, Gary. <laughs> this is the last time John Levick would hear a human voice until the next train came by four days later. I was now entering the territory of the Cree Indian tribe, and there's a version of the polar bear song in their language too. Passengers are on their way home from a 24-hour shopping marathon. For some, a first taste of life in the big city. The train stocks up the small communities along the track. The train snack bar serves as a mobile candy store for kids. It's the only shop in town. This northern branch line is still running because without it the whole region would die. But people are worried about the closing of the main line which feeds it. The train is the only reliable link with the outside world. train dies, so will the settlements it serves. Like Coral Rapids, a one-house town in the middle of nowhere where the train only stops when there's somebody to stop for. Good day, sir. It's a long trip. There's a lot of miles to cover and a lot of time to kill. An Indian sculptor used the train as a rolling workshop. And my seatmate was working at her family business, embroidering moose hide. Yes, I go hunting with my husband. And we wait for hours and hours for geese to come. So we just look around with our binoculars and geese would come by. And, uh, like my husband's got poor sight eh, in his eyes. And he uses me for a binocular sometimes, and I see them far coming, eh? <laughs> but I never kill a moose, though. <laughs> but, my, but I see my husband kill a moose quite a few times. Aha! There were lots of moose loose around here, waiting for my call. In fact, the end of the line turned out to be a town called Moosonee, on the edge of the Arctic Ocean. Next morning, there was no genuine wildlife to be seen, just a small community of 1,400 people. It turned out to be one of the oldest settlements in all of Canada. For three centuries, the Cree Indians who live here have traded furs with the Hudson's Bay Company. It's quite an up-to-date little settlement. It's even got a street and a school bus, and both stop at the edge of town but the Cree cling stubbornly to their traditions. In many backyards, they were roasting geese and baking Indian bread to the sound of tape-recorded tribal powwow music. With a couple of days between trains, I got an intriguing invitation to a Cree religious ceremony on the edge of Hudson Bay. That night, on a lonely island, I found myself crouching in a huddle of Cree Indians preparing for an ancient tribal ceremony. 
The Indian name for it is a sweat lodge. It was led by Bob, a university-educated medicine man. This uh, sweat lodge was given to us through the creator. He created the willows that we're going to be using. He created the rocks that we're going to use. He created the water that we're going to use. There's nothing there that he didn't create. And he also created us. And we're just using what our ancestors were given for generations. And it's coming back. And it's young people like ourselves that are very into, into it. And it's up to us to carry this on. One by one, shadowy figures appeared, then disappeared into a kind of darkened hut. Cameras are not allowed to record the ceremony, but I was invited to take part. In the sub-zero temperature, I stripped to my undershorts and crept back 10,000 years in time. What happened inside? It was pitch black, apart from some glowing red hot stones. I was handed an Indian peace pipe, took a puff and passed it on. In the darkness, someone ran hands over my sweating body in a kind of faith healing. Yet it was strangely moving too, for I glimpsed something I had to come to Canada to find. The possibility that people can preserve their traditional ways, distinct from other cultures around them, yet respect each other enough to share one country together. It was an inspiring vision, or perhaps it was only a dream. Another day was another world. I had traveled south, then west, and caught another train. The iron road was taking me even further north, to Churchill on the doorstep of the Arctic. What's it like out there? It's wintry. It's a Canadian scene. Well, it certainly wasn't Florida. This part of Canada is big and bleak and barren. And again, only one thing holds it together. Spaghetti seems to be the game. Oh, I think I'll have a beer. I lunched with Dan Gurevich, the world's leading photographer of polar bears, and Eric Luke, a staff sergeant of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I didn't want to be stationed in Churchill uh, when I was, I was posted there. And, uh, I didn't have a choice in going, and I really resented the fact I was up there. And when I got there, I found out that uh, it was nothing like I thought it would be. Time almost stands still up there. You don't march the same drum you do anywhere else because weather controls all. And uh, as frustrating as that may be, there's a magical uh, mystery about it, and it's, it's, it's fun. Outside, the telephone poles were practically horizontal because the ground is permanently frozen. The stunted trees barely survive. People who live out here seem just as tenacious. Most of this town was heading north to do their shopping. And there was delivery service for those who stayed behind. Bacon, you know, stroganoff, Swiss steak. 
after them. <laughs> Life is hard out here. The Canadian novelist Margaret Atwood once wrote that while the American ethic is based on winning, the Canadian one is based on survival. In this part of Canada, I can see what she meant. Seasoned passengers settled in for the night. But for some of us, this was all new. As we rolled further and further north, I felt a strange restlessness. Something out there was calling to me. I called back. Next morning, we'd left the last tree behind. This is a desert in the deep freeze. Ahead was the end of the line. Churchill, polar bear capital of the planet. This remote town was once a thriving port, shipping Canadian wheat directly to the Soviet Union across the Arctic Sea. These days, business is slow, and only a few ships come in each year before Hudson Bay freezes over. The population is shrinking, and eventually there may be no one left but the native people who lived here for more than 10,000 years. Just wonder. Bye-bye. Most people in town were tourists, here to see the other species that's been gathering on the edge of Churchill since long before the town was built. Shall we go into the uh, trading post? Yeah, okay. But before I went looking for bear, I needed the right equipment. This is the wow. Well stopped, eh? Yeah. Nina. And this uh, young lady, Penny Rawlings. Hello. Hi. Hello, Penny. How do you do? How are you, Dan? We, we hug down south. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a problem, Penny. Cold ears. Oh, I guess you're going to have to buy some ear mouse. Let's try a hat. Okay. Okay. You like that one with the tail, eh? Well. What do you think? Oh, you look like mean? the original Davy Crockett. See, the problem is I can't now put my own hat on, really, oh, can I? Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> look at the little guy on there. He looks great. Yeah, <laughs> let's go the earmuff for it all. Let's okay. try it. How decadent do you want to be here? We've got Norwegian blue fox. We've got mink. How about some coyote? That would match the rough on your jacket there. Good. <laughs> It's me. It's you. It's me. Oh, yeah, it's me. you like those? Okay, good. I think that solves the problem. And so I was off to look for bear. Sixteen of them were cooped up inside a polar bear jail, built to detain impulsive bears who wander into town uninvited. Eventually, these jail bears would be turned loose. For now, they're locked up in the cooler. But there's plenty more where they came from, right on the edge of town. These bears looked quite friendly, but some locals were there to make sure they didn't get too friendly. As long as they stay on the perimeter, that's all right. A playful tap from a 1,200-pound polar bear could be distinctly hazardous to your health. Yeah. 
when one brawny Bruin came too close, visitors were asked to step inside while experts kept the peace. Okay, people that are uh, not essential may be moved to this, you know, out of the working area. Oh, that's a big one. I wouldn't want to pick a fight with him. They were only firing blanks, but fortunately, the bears didn't know that. Seeing these handsome beasts relaxing in the sunshine reminded me of their unfortunate colleagues doing time back in the jail. Okay, wakey, wakey, rise and shine. Winter's coming, you'll be out soon. 16 bears and not a growl. It didn't make sense. Suddenly, it did. The bears weren't asleep, and they certainly weren't dead. They were zonked out on tranquilizers. The Canadian Wildlife Service was running them out of town. It was Operation Bear Lift. fly three bears at a time. They're transported a couple of hundred miles out of town. Hopefully, when they wake up, they won't walk straight back. And speaking of leaving town, I had a train to catch. There's a big steel rail train rolling down the tracks. I was heading back for the sunnier south entertained by Bill Hoffmeister, the singing baggage man. Nobody saw me leaving, it was the only thing to do. Started riding on the rocking top of a boxcar painted blue. Well, there must be a lot of pain inside my head To have the rocking top of the boxcar painted blue become a bed Everything's so confusing, I can't believe it's true How could everything go and change so much, simply losing you? Like a man gone blind, I've been trying to find the end of a tangled thread. Starting with the angry things you say. I know I'm quite a sight, I'm rolling in the night with the rain dripping from my hat. But a broken heart going here, a heart here going, but I still fly. I'm sitting around playing that guitar off me. One. One more round, that's it. Okay. Thirty hours and a thousand miles later, I was back among the bright lights, but I had no time to lose. Well, there's a big steel rail train going down the tracks. I had left the frozen north of Churchill far behind and rejoined the main trans-Canadian line leading west towards the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Ocean. I get to where she's going, I don't know what I'm gonna do. 
as dawn broke, the snow and the trees had vanished, and I was under the enormous sky of the prairies. Of a black sky. It was the wheat growing province of Saskatchewan, and my next stop, a town called Swift Current. It was six in the morning in Swift Current. Not many people about, except some Hutterites, members of a religious farming community whose principles obviously include getting an early start. The prairie's isolation from the outside world seems to have helped them preserve their way of life. Maybe it's the same isolation that makes radio so popular out here. Slip right through my hand. Art Warman is the king of prairie radio. Oh, it's a great job. You know, you hear the kind of music you like and you sing along and... From his wheelchair, Art runs Saskatchewan's oh, most popular radio show. Ago, and that's our own it's called the Tractor Line right because many of his regular callers are listening in their tractors. Calendar coming up, and Buck Owens is going to be our star on that one. Right now, though, let's go to the Tractor Line and see if we got. Hello there. Yeah, how are you doing today? By golly, if it isn't Aubrey Putnam, how in the world are you doing, Aubrey? Well, we're doing all right here, you know. You and Aggie, right? Well, Aggie said to phone you up. She's out on the tractor right now, doing a little fall tilling, you know. All right. She's got her radio on, and you're coming in pretty good in her tractor there. She, well, that's good. Anyway, she's going to be coming in pretty soon. She's got to she's gotta get the turkeys in before dark, or they start roosting in the neighbor's trees, you know. These are the youngest-looking towns I saw in Canada. In fact, there's nothing older than the railroad out here, because settlers had no way of getting here until the railway connected the prairies to the outside world. I see this tree, it is bound to this tree, this tree. To a visitor, this is the part of Canada that looks most like the United States. There is no natural separation at all between the wheat lands of the two countries. But this train defied geography. This train, well, it is bad. By taking the almost impossible route east-west, Canada's patriotic direction. The rails tied the Canadian prairies to the oceans and to world markets, and stitched Canada together as one country. This train, it don't carry no back sliders. This train, this train. Now the train service to many of these towns was being closed down. And I couldn't help but wonder. This train what protected Western no Canada from the powerful pull of its southern neighbor now that the east-west link is broken? This train no longer carries cattle out of prairie towns like Mankota, Saskatchewan. Today, they go by truck, and many of them go south to markets in the U.S., just a few miles down the road. In fact, I had to look hard to see that this wasn't the American Midwest. Not only do these cowboys look the same as their southern neighbors, it turns out they dislike the same people. The all-powerful eastern banks and supermarket bosses who set the prices here. I could see American and Canadian cowboys 
use the same silent language. Understand the language. One false move, and you could wind up earning five thousand pounds of T-bone steak. These people live so far from the rest of Canada and so close to their American neighbours that national lines can get blurred. People are same, same thing as us, the same problems. And they have their problems with the government all in the east and the west gets the short end of the stick there the same way. Instead of the, the border going east and west, it should have went north and south. Like it, it wouldn't matter to me if, if Canada were to become a part of the states or, you know, that's, I think being an American would be just as great as being a Canadian. beside the US border with a nagging thought. On the map, Canada looked so solid. On the ground, it felt so fragile. Perhaps the only thing really Canadian out here was this train. And even as I traveled, the morning paper told me the train I was on was closing down behind me. Towns that owed their very existence to the railway, Swift Current, Medicine Hat, Moose Jaw, would soon have no train at all. Among the first casualties was going to be our engineer, who'd given his life to the railway. I came to Medicine Hat, I was 17 years old, and I was looking for a job. October the 22nd, 1947, I started in the railway. This, this railway right here, passenger service, is the history of this country, you know? That's what made this country. It's, it's, it's the railway that brought the people in here that made this country, you know? All these farms out here, originally these people came on the railway. Crossing Canada by train, I felt I was sitting in the seats of the pioneers. The train was a rolling classroom teaching generations of Canadians their history and geography. Animal? No. What? God. I think you'd like to eat one of those for your breakfast, like shredded the big wheat. shredded wheat. Yeah, they do like <laughs> shredded wheat. <laughs> Put that on your plate. You have to have lots of milk, eh? and have a whole cow. Yeah. <laughs> Even the endless Canadian prairies do have an end. A full day out of Swift Current, we sighted a line of mountains growing out of the horizon, the legendary Canadian Rockies. Beaver, yeah. It's like Jesse's beavers, eh? The train was filling up with some new and interesting faces. These Japanese tourists filled a whole car. These are the mountains that made this train world famous, or maybe the other way around. And I was pulling into the railway's most famous stop. Any 
Anyone who's heard of Canada has heard of Banff, an elegant European-style spa that's been a playground of the international train set, the aristocrats, ordinary millionaires and other members of the ruling class who've been taking the waters here since the days of Queen Victoria. But who, I wondered, comes here now? Banff is still a magnet for tourists looking for elegant living and beautiful scenery. But now they come across the Pacific instead of the Atlantic. Many of them are opening businesses and settling in. As always, the new pioneers are getting a friendly welcome from the natives. Banff seemed like a good chance to pick up a souvenir of Canada, although that one was a bit big for my suitcase. Instead, I chose the Japanese tourist's all-purpose favourite, a beaver dressed in a Mountie uniform. I had an opportunity to try some Japanese, since the sales girls spoke little English, despite eight years in Canada. They told me that was part of the reason they liked it here. They could escape the big city pressures of Japan and create a home here, speaking Japanese all day in the Canadian mountains. Before I left Banff, I had a stroke of luck. With time running out, I was still keen to test my moose calling skills. These beasts, whatever they were, looked like a receptive audience. All I risked was a little embarrassment. It was the story of my life. Don't call us, we'll call you. And so I left on the final leg of my journey through the last and greatest of the railway's triumphs, the crossing of the Canadian Rockies. Our conductor, Lloyd Metcalf, had been giving a running commentary on the trip through the mountains for a quarter of a century. That's the mountain that's on the back of your $20 bill right now. Lake Louise would be right over here and this is behind and we come up and around. It's, but that's the one that's on the back of our $20 bill today. He spent much of the trip time? giving the official time from his railwayman's pocket watch. <laughs> well, it's still Still 1637. It would still be 1637. <laughs> like Meanwhile, up in front, a young man was living out every boy's fantasy. He was playing with a Hello. real train. Is that switch lined over? Now you see that white there? That white sink. One on the side of the track, out the side there. Oh, yeah. So that's a whistle. That yeah. a whistle. Let me see. Push that down too long. Short little one. Now a long one. That's it. Now you press this bell. This is long.
how we see how we're coming into the tunnel right ahead of us here? Yeah. Coming right in. Now don't you get start scared, young lad, because okay. isn't this nice? stack, uh, the, the working and the exhaust. Oh, you go through the country at night and uh, that old steam engine was uh, really uh, barking, you might say, and uh, it just made you feel like it was alive. I guess them days are gone. This renowned train through the Rockies will continue to operate one day a week but only in summer as an expensive package tour. The regular passenger service was terminated shortly after my trip. The train that plied its way through the Canadian Rockies every day for a hundred years has made its last regular run. My last night on the train, there was a subdued atmosphere. Some of the staff were wearing black armbands. This black armband symbolizes not only the, the end of my career, it end, symbolized the death of an era in, in rail travel. It's an institution. You talk, about, you talk to people. I remember as a kid, we grew up, my mom and dad lived on the CPR main line. I remember as a kid standing out there watching the Canadian flash by when it was brand new. They had the half doors open and all the porters were out, all dressed in white, decked in white. They looked so great. And I always thought, when I grew up, I'd love to work on a railroad. Little did I know that 30 years later, I'd be doing it. 30 years of history. Because they don't think they're making money. Do we have to make money to keep something like this world? This is, you know, this, governments all over the world piss money up the wall on, on a lot more frivolous things than, than a national railroad. And they're gonna, I just can't believe that they would destroy the national dream. It's disgusting. I gotta go. My last morning on the train, and already the long trip seemed like a dream. Had I really seen moose and mounties, prairies and polar bears? Had I prayed to the great spirit with the Cree Indians and gone trapping with a beaver-loving patrol officer? Did all this exist in one country, let alone one train ride? trip that could never be done again. Canada has always seemed a bit of a miracle. It seemed even more so now that the railway that built it was closing down. What I wondered was the country's future. Would it tear apart at its political seams, drift fragment by fragment into the arms of its giant neighbour? or fulfilled its promise. A new nation, conceived in compromise and dedicated to the proposition that different cultures can prosper together and none be overwhelmed. I 
had reached Vancouver, the long trip was over, perhaps forever. I'd started at the Atlantic and reached the Pacific, a whole continent away. In all, I'd travel more than 7,000 miles. My own home in Australia was far across the sea, but I felt very much at home here too. I suspected I'd fit in well, make quite a good Canadian. Somewhere inside me, I still heard the call of the wild. And someday, I'm going to get it right. the white 